Welcome back to Love, Sweat, and Tears, Ingredients for a Transformative Campus Leadership. Today, I'm talking with Robert Duron. He's been a superintendent at multiple districts in Texas, and he's also been a board member of Dallas, the Texas Association for Latino hmm, Administrators and Superintendents. There we go. Um, and he's also been on the board of TASB, um, the school board association in Texas. And he was the superintendent at the, my school district when I was in high school. Um, my father, he was a school psychologist and um, his office was there with Roberts at the central office at the time. And um, when we found out that he had been in Socorro and we were kind of, you know, I was excited and doing my research about him and stuff, um, called up my dad and said, hey, you know, what was he like? Tell me about him. What do you remember about him? And this was a long time ago. Um, but, you know, my dad had said that the things he really remembered about him was that he would listen to you, that he would stop and take time and um, and really, you know, meet your eyes and, and listen to you. And um, I just felt like that was something remarkable. You don't hear a lot of people say that about their superintendents. And so I was really excited to get to talk with him and hear his story and his heart and his vision. And we talk a lot about Dallas um, and just their mentorship program that they have created there and how important that is, how important it is to have people that can speak truth to you, that can tell you when you're you know, doing stuff maybe you shouldn't be doing or speak to your areas of weaknesses and help you to grow those and encourage you along the way. And um, it was just such a wonderful conversation and I hope you guys really enjoy it. Robert Duron, right now, our kind of our target audience for this podcast is campus leaders, especially campus leaders that are feeling under-resourced or that are new to the job and trying to learn everything that they can and finding that they have more questions than answers and maybe don't even know where to go to get the answers to their questions. Um, and so, um, you know, Tommy, Tina Harrow is so well connected and um, knows that you are too and really just want to hear a lot about what you're doing right now and why it's exciting and why it's important for campus leaders. Before we get there, I want to hear a little bit about your background and your history and where you come from and how you got to where you are. Well, I'm originally from Waco, uh, okay. Texas, born and raised there um, from a family of seven. Uh, okay. And obviously education was very important to us. Sure. I'm proud to say that uh, of the seven, four of us graduated with degrees and three of wow. us with our doctorate degrees. So. Wow. And I think the point there is, you know, they talk a lot about college ready in schools. Well, our yeah. parents had us really college ready. So mm. I was blessed, really, quite frankly, to have that. I'll use this word a lot probably during this conversation, that my parents really provided me that agency. You know, in other words, if uh, there were low expectations from anybody around me at school, teachers yeah. or anything, uh, they said, ignore that. You're going to go to college along with my sisters. Mm. So uh, I was blessed there. Went to East Texas State as my undergrad and then um, um, uh, was a teacher and a coach for uh, about eight to ten years. Okay. And yeah, so uh, was in the classroom and then got my mid-management and administration. Uh, been in um, Waco, went back to Waco as an administrator, Clear Creek Independent School District as an okay. assistant superintendent. Fast forwarding from there, superintendent in Socorro mm -hmm. ISD outside of El Paso and then uh, ended my career, my public education career as superintendent of San Antonio ISD for seven years. Um, from there, deputy commissioner for a little bit. It was just a landing okay. spot for me yeah. for 18 months there okay. at TEA. Uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been an executive director for Texas Association of School Boards. Okay, mm. how did you get there? What what, what actually? You there? I was uh, went to lunch one day with with a guy named uh, uh, Jim Crow, who was the CEO. I didn't really know Jim, and mm -hmm. I thought I knew just about everybody in education. Yeah. And I thought maybe uh, through my work with the agency, he wanted to just kind of tap TEA resources or something. I had yeah. no idea. But he actually recruited me. He wanted me to come over and take over the member services division. Okay. That primarily is outward facing to uh, school board members. It's a school board member association right. uh, doing event planning like this conference that we're at here, uh, board training, legal services, policy services, uh, superintendent searches. So I did that for 10 years and learned quite a bit. Very blessed to be there. Yeah. Just recently stepped down, took a lesser role. Um, my wife, Jody, superintendent in Elgin mm -hmm. ISD, she just been there 10 years and recently retired herself. So it's kind of a career shift for both of us. Yeah. And we're doing a, 
now we're doing you know part-time consulting and I'm still a consultant with TASB mm -hmm. and uh, I'm the executive director for the Texas Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendent Thales. Yes. I uh, started that in April so that's my new sort of challenge and what keeps me busy and much busier than I wanted to be but it's it's sure. good work yeah. What what drew you to Thales? Oh well I've been a member I've been on their board before okay. uh, I like their mission I've uh, there's there's two things that I'm very I've, all my life I've been very passionate about is education mm -hmm. and leadership which is kind of okay. the theme for this yeah. so so it was a good fit for me as TASB was and it, it allows me to stay connected with those that are still in the profession yeah. uh, so there are a lot there's a lot of upside to it being around leaders around people that are passionate about educators yeah. and of course with Latino students but all students so uh, it allows me that opportunity to do that you know at my age and my career uh, I think what I was excited about is I bring my experience to the executive director's role mm -hmm. uh, and it, it just as a bonus my experience with TASB and yeah. being in a nonprofit a huge nonprofit like that so I thought maybe I could contribute to Thales in that way uh, again from my field experience but also from working at TASB I think uh, some of those connections some of those lessons learned insights and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be, hopefully it's going to benefit uh, Thales as well. For people that don't know what Thales is, can you tell us a little bit about what their mission is, what they do? Yeah, Why well, so, exciting? I mean, obviously, uh, Latinos, it's, it's primarily uh, uh, geared at, at providing opportunity for Latino leaders, uh, teachers that want to mm -hmm. become leaders in their own schools and their own district. We try to promote that. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but its mission is to provide those that agency for these individuals in guidance and in, in mentoring. Uh, resources for them, yeah. uh, connections more than anything. So that's kind of what we're focusing on now is is enhancing our uh, viability and being able to do that. Our, mm -hmm. our uh, you know connecting out with other resources. Yeah. We're getting really good uh, work from our sponsors, you included, which yeah. we appreciate. Yeah. yeah, that buy into that mission, you know, and then ultimately, obviously. Uh, with the majority of the students now in Texas being Latinos, it's it's important that it's cliche, but that these students see people that look like them, that have yeah. walked their path, that uh, can resonate with them, yeah. uh, and then ultimately, you know, making this a better place to live. And I like we used to say when I was in San Antonio that we 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 want to ensure that these young students are coming up and they're not tax burdens, but they they're mm -hmm. taxpayers. Mm -hmm in whatever capacity they do when they graduate so it, or, or feel when they graduate. So uh, that's, that, that keeps us on fire. That keeps us really uh, motivated. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that Dallas does to accomplish that mission? Yeah, well, we have a mentoring program. Uh, and, and really, the vi our vision for our mentoring program is, uh, I was just sharing this with the board this morning, mm. is that uh, when I reflect back on my career, uh, in when, especially when I was a school teacher, you, invariably what happens for most individuals that go into leadership is they are recognized by their fellow teachers as someone who has the capacity or the potential to become a leader. Okay. And yeah. they begin to say, you know, you'd be a good assistant principal or you'd be a good principal one day or something. And I, I was fortunate to be around people who sometimes correct me on what I need to improve to get there, sure. but that they would enjoy, you know, working with me and, and, and for me one day. So that encouraged me to go on and get my master's degree, et cetera, fill in the blank, as yeah. I just mentioned my resume yeah. earlier. But uh, the agency for doing that, for going from like, for example, from a teacher to assistant principal happens at the local level. Mm. And so I, I didn't want to become a, a, an assistant principal just anywhere in Texas. And I had my family in that district. I wanted to move up to be an assistant principal in that district and then a principal. And yeah. then maybe at central office locally. But the higher you go up in your career, the less opportunity, obviously, because there are fewer jobs up at the top, yeah. teachers all the way to superintendent. And so your agency then has to be really fulfilled from a statewide level, sure. right? So other districts, other regions. And so our thought at Thales is that we provide agency for those that are from the, going from the classroom to, the, again, that school leadership and maybe even district assistant superintendent level. Yeah. But once they reach there, we want to develop our statewide uh, okay. uh, mentor program to prepare them to become superintendents. And then making those connections statewide as a principal, finding out those other you know, folks that can really help them out in those careers. It's very important. I mean, I, I shared with our mentor group last Saturday that don't underestimate talking to someone. 
you should mm -hmm. give them I call it you should give them your one minute commercial about who you are yeah. and what your goals are because uh, it's a small world out there and people will connect and say I know somebody in Waco I know somebody in Brownsville yeah. who has a lot of potential and they're ready to make this next move and uh, that's what what's what helped me in my career so all that to say that's what we're trying to recreate in the Valos mentoring program and okay. it's going well yeah. how, do, how does that work well, uh, the the mentoring program. Yeah. yeah, they meet. They meet. They coincide. Their meetings coincide really with our uh, our meetings that we have. We have, like okay. for example, we have our summer conference coming up. Okay. We meet at they meet at TAS, at TAS. So it's almost quarterly. It just coincides with the events. Okay. And then they do stuff online. They do online okay. learning. Uh, they have assignments. They all have mentors. Wow. They connect with their mentors. The mentees do. Okay. Uh, I have one, and she's a high school principal. A lot of potential. But yeah, we just meet with them, and then we, you know, we get together at these conferences and, you know, reconnect and. So it's very community touch based. based. It's not it really just is. Yeah. mentor and mentee, but they all kind of have like cohort groups that they work with. Yeah, also. we have a cohort every year. Yeah, they okay. kind of go through it together. Yeah, and it's two years each, and so yeah, it's. So it's overlap. this kind of set two year program. Yeah, uh -huh. and you join the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. If you're interested in becoming a mentor. What is that? What is that process like? Yeah. How do you, as a leader of leaders, identify people that would be good leaders? Yeah, actually, with two ways, we either recruit, and we have like we okay. have two that just volunteered to become. They want to give back, and that okay. that's kind of what happens again when you get later on yeah. in your career. You have more time, yeah. especially after you retire. Sure. And uh, so we get them both ways. We either recruit okay. them. I'll see some here, and hey, I'm leaving. It. Hey, you want to be a mentor for our program? Yeah. Oh yeah, I can do that. Or we, uh, you know, sometimes they just uh, volunteer, so yeah. it's a two-way thing, yeah. How, how big is that program? Like how many oh, we people? probably have about 20 to 25 in every cohort. Okay. Yeah, with, with mentors. Sometimes you get two mentees, yeah. but uh, yeah. And wow. we have a really good director, Lucio Calzada. I have to give him a plug. He's okay. done a great job. Our board, we're, we're pleased. Now, with that said, we're looking for ways, by the way, to okay. ramp up and improve the, the program. I mean, continuous improvement. Uh, we want to be able to uh, find maybe more mentors and mentees sure. and, and build the program. Yeah. Yeah. Who whose idea was it? How did this this mentor program kind of come about? I I think it it predates me obviously, sure. but I think it just it's it's just a part of our mission. You know, it's mm. it's that we if we don't develop leaders beginning with our school children yeah. and teach them what you know the core values, the tenets of being a really strong leader, presenting yeah. yourself as a leader, it just it's just baked into who we are, really. Yeah. It's too important not to, I should say. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I see so often kind of different associations having events or having trainings online, or but that communal aspect of having a group of people that you can reach out to, and then a specific person that you can ask your deeper questions to that knows you a little bit better. Yeah. That's just such, I don't see that as often. Yeah. And that's really intriguing to me. Yeah, and it's encouraging for our mentees who come from across the state to connect with folks that are walking their path, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they're different locations, they have mm -hmm. common problems, common challenges. So they connect, they make those connections. And we have several, don't ask me to name them, but we have several <laughs> superintendents that, that uh, are now mentors mm -hmm. that have been through our program. And, and uh, they uh, credit making those connections early, both their mentors and their fellow, uh, you know, uh, cohort members sure. and it's great to see them all become superintendents and yeah, yeah that's the that's the end game yeah. so for for a campus leader that is finding themselves enjoying the leadership position and wants to develop their own leadership skills more mm. what are some first steps that they can take towards doing that so my yeah that's a good question I think if you are a campus assistant principal or principal mm -hmm. and you're really, let's just say you're looking to make that next move. Sure. I think, and this may be difficult for some of them to hear, but you, mm -hmm. you do not make that, it's my advice. Sure. Connecting yeah, backwards, right? Is don't <clears throat> even pr think about making that next move and or trying to leverage yourself with those opportunities until you've really mastered what you're doing mm. at the current level. You have to, as an assistant principal, your principal needs to, um, depending on the relationship, sure. 
but uh, I think you need your endorsement of your immediate supervisor as someone that's, you know, you're ready to take over yeah. a campus, right? And uh, you'll hear that from some of the folks that you su supervise, like teachers, and yeah. you, you should have a campus one day. Yeah. I think you need to begin hearing that before you go out on your own yeah. and assuming that you are ready. Um, uh, just, for example, when I was thought I was ready to become a superintendent, sure. my mentor, John Wilson in Clear Creek, he, was, he, he looked at me after three years of being an assistant soup, he says, no, you're, you're not ready yet. And that's the mm -hmm. kind of candid feedback you need to hear. Yeah. There's just still some things he wanted to work. And by the way, I thought I was at the time. Sure. But looking back, and certainly when, once I became a superintendent and yeah. was in the seat for six months, I realized I wasn't ready at the time. Yeah. So back to the question, I think master your current level of assignment and role. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you have someone who can give you open, honest feedback if you're not. Yeah. And be very candid with you. That's, mm -hmm. that's huge. Yeah. And then I think then it's, it's, it's if, if and, and one day John did tell me, Dr. Wilson, uh, yeah, you are ready. You're ready to branch out. That's when I went to Socorro. Wow. So yeah, th that extra three or four years that he made me sort of marinate a little bit more yeah. and, and, and develop, it, it really paid off. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's my advice. Yeah. yeah. To, to uh, I would also say that understand um, the importance of being um, there, there's an expression that I was just doing a session this morning that every leader, every organization's problem is a leadership problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so learn how to own any problems that uh, might be occurring in your organization if you're one of the leaders. Right? Don't push that off on the teachers or the kids or anything like that. If there's a problem on that campus, I'll use the campus, sure. the yeah. organization, uh, and you're the leader, you're a big part of the problem, mm. you, and you need to solve that. So control what you can control. You've heard that, and, you know, yeah, right. master the controllables. Yeah. Don't worry about anything else, but uh, develop that way. And then that, that's really what's helped me in my career. But more than anything, finding people that can be honest and give you honest feedback. And some of that feedback came from some of my teachers that I supervised. Mm. They came in and said, you know, you were not clear with us and now you're holding us accountable and you need to be more clear we like you but so that feedback for those courageous folks that can give that kind yeah. of feedback and maybe that segues into another thing is or, or they're related is um, yeah and this is huge is to embrace your vulnerabilities mm. you know your weaknesses That's because true. you can't you can't uh, push them away when people point them out to you. Yeah, it's very difficult. The ego uh, has a hard time with that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's staying extremely confident in where you're going and what you're doing. But the opposite of that is being humble enough to know that you've got a lot to learn. And I think that's what most people want to work for someone like that. Yeah. And uh, that they can teach you something as their yeah. leader and then learn from you as their leader. I think that's the perfect match. That's what's worked in my career. Yeah, how, mm -hmm. did, how did you cultivate that? That was something that my dad had remembered working with you 15 years ago, was mm. that you listened and you were humble. And a lot, of, a lot of leaders, especially at the district level, don't always have that. So how did you cultivate that and develop that as a value in, in your leadership skills? Yeah, well, I don't know. That's a good question. I think I think it's pro my background probably had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, my my dad certainly kept me humble. I'll, begin, mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. And my and my mother just it was just kind of our core values as a, probably a family more than anything. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, well, and by the way, I'm not sharing with you some of the uh, <laughs> mistakes that I've made. Of course. And I think I think sometimes having to check my ego. I'm an avid reader, so things like Seven Habits of Highly Effective mm -hmm. People, I, I won't go down my library, but I'm an avid reader. Uh, thanks to one of my, the greatest teachers I ever had, that's a different story, mm -hmm. but, um, but that's important. She changed my life because she had me fall in love with reading. I had to plug her just really yeah, quick. Of course. Uh, we've all had that teacher with right. us, right? And so, so she, when I was a re reading, I started seeing the weaknesses that if I don't check this, along with the feedback I was getting from other folks, yeah. uh, this is going to be a real struggle for me, and yeah. I'm not going to be able to advance. So I think reading, learning from thought leaders, yeah. um, listening to folks, getting feedback, and then, yeah, I mean, 
and it was a job that I absolutely loved doing, and if I wanted to keep doing it, I had to get better at it. Watching yeah. others, by the way, the others that just were mentors for me and how yeah. they operated, how would you do this, how would you do that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How have you kind of baked that ethos into what you're doing with Dallas? Actually, uh, Or was uh, it there to begin with? Was that why you were a good fit? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think generally probably uh, it, it really is. I, mm -hmm. I, I was very, I didn't even mention our board. I know it's, it's politically correct to honor your board because you, I work for them, but I think the class of people that we had on that board was something that attracted me to. I had mm -hmm. a lot of respect for folks on there, mutual respect. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that's part of who we are, that mm -hmm. extreme confidence yet humility. Let's all learn and grow as an organization. Yeah, yeah I mean, it starts at the top. I'm not the president, right. but uh, our board really buys into those, those core values. They yeah. buy into those core values. And uh, uh, I think that our culture is one in our tallest board that if you're, if you're not going to buy into those things, you're probably not going to be a good fit. Yeah. And that's important because I think it resonates down to the membership as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think is, uh, like for our campus leaders listening, mm. um, what would be one thing that they could do differently tomorrow to help impact their leadership, to make them a better leader? I, I, so I think the most important thing you can do to enhance your leadership is to focus on how well you know and, and really reflect on how much you truly care about those that are under your under your watch mm. yeah you know they the uh, if if i'm struggling with you as a teacher yeah and and we're not communicating right then uh, again if it's a problem in this this organization i begin with me and how well yeah. do i know her how well do i understand what she's yeah. going through and if you skip over that and just use your authority to do those, to, to, to really uh, try to improve that behavior or correct that behavior, it's not gonna work. Yeah. So, so I, have to, I have to really, in order for me to influence you, yeah. I have to, you have to know that I truly care. Yeah. So, so that, that's something, if you wanna kind of, um, as a principal, kind of reflect on the 30, 40 teachers that you have assigned to you, yeah. how well do I know them? Do they know I care about them? Because invariably, we're going to create change on this campus, and I'm going to ask you to change. And for me to start uh, pushing you as to why you're not on board with us, for you to look at me and say, you know, you don't even know me. Yeah, right. I think, I think and you're over here telling me what to do, right. and, and you, you don't even know that I'm struggling with this or that. Sure. Uh, and so when you think about it, that's sort of the same model as a great teacher. Yeah. If you really want to be a, an influencer of kids, yeah. They have to know that you love them and care about them. And then when they know that, you can tell them to do anything. That was the case for me. Yeah. It? yeah. They'll work harder for you. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll uh, reciprocate with that care and respect yeah. for you. Uh, and teachers that struggle, I'm going to go back to the teachers, sure. okay? Teachers that struggle, they just don't understand that they're uh, using their authority, yeah. you know, versus their influence over these kids. Right. And the magic happens when you use that influence. And that influence only comes again with respect, mutual respect and love for one another. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about using your influence over your authority. Yeah, yeah. I actually did a session. Uh, this is fresh on my mind because I'm doing a session okay. that's yeah. called Leading Without Authority. And I'm not plugging that at all. Sure. I'm just yeah, saying it's it's sort of a reflection it, on my career, and it's yeah. uh, I'll drop I will drop a couple of resources. But there's a uh, Kim Scott who wrote uh, okay. Radical Candor. Okay. She talks about caring deeply for people before you can be really candid with them. Uh, great TED Talk. If anybody that's listening wants to tune in on Kim awesome. Scott's yeah Radical Candor, and then the book. Uh, and I've not really mentioned being an avid reader. Yeah. One of my going back all the way to Socorro when I was yeah. a superintendent, and even as an assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I've used book studies with those that are under my watch yeah. because I call that we, we talk in bullets and we all know. When I was a superintendent in San Antonio with a hundred um, campuses, a hundred principals, yeah. you know, we, I could go to them and, and uh, <laughs> if anyone were listening to this now, they'd go, yeah, we remember that. <laughs> if, if I said, you know, they knew what the meaning of, of we don't want to flinch because we all read this book, sure. or move the salt shaker to the middle of the table. Yeah. Now to you, that's Greek, but right. to all of us, it's like, ah, oh, that's that pointer. And it's, yeah. it's so, you know, 
it, it's like, oh, all he does is read books and tell people what are in books. No, we read them together yeah. and we reflect on them. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with my principals about leadership yeah. and just coaching them and teaching them. When I had time to do that yeah. during their meetings, and that made a big difference, yeah. yeah. They well, loved learning. I know Brene Brown, who's oh, speaking at TASA, she talks a lot about the importance of shared language yeah. and how mm -hmm. much that builds community and trust in communities is mm -hmm. having that shared language. Um, that's really cool. I yeah, and that. if you mention Brene, Brene that was, she's one of my thought leaders, of course, for a lot of people, yeah. obviously. Incredible, it's yeah. incredible that she's here at this conference. Yeah. But she really gave me that insight on that vulnerability yeah. piece. You know, wow, that's powerful. Because yeah. the ego doesn't like that, no. but it's, it's magic. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more like about the, the makeup of the general members of Thales? Like is it, yeah. you have teachers, you have campus level admin, you have district level admin. Yes. Who are the members of Thales and how can you, how, how does each kind of um, sphere uh, develop in, in the organization? What do you offer each kind of? Yeah. Well, our membership, we're about 250, 260 members now, okay. and that's what, at last counts, it could be up since then. I would say about about 45% of them are superintendents. Okay. And assistant superintendents, okay. deputies, et cetera, central sure. office. But we do have some teachers. We yeah. have actually two or three or four professors that do, you know, that do uh, obviously are teaching Latino students, so we have some of those. But for the most, and we, yeah, again, we have some teachers. But back to the question about, yeah how we work with teachers. I think uh, we were just meeting this morning and hearing from one of our affiliates from the El, El Paso area, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Paz, he was our uh, great leader there mm -hmm. in, in our that affiliate, that a lot of the teachers that, going back to your question earlier, that are really being encouraged and or are encouraged yeah. to themselves yeah. to become administrators, they're, again, they, they uh, we hope, and, and it's our idea that they use the affiliate to make those connections and then uh, move in, segue into those uh, administrative positions, yeah. We have, and by the way, so we have a variant. Some are just fledgling because they've just started, uh, but I, I think the El Paso uh, affiliate is, is, is our strongest. They're more sure. organized, and um, but we have we have one in Central Texas. We okay. have one in Rio Grande Valley that's just launched. We have okay. one in El Paso, obviously. Uh, we have one in the Houston area, Dallas area. Garland has one. Uh, we're, we're considering one in the Gulf Coast Valley to start one there, okay. but it's really uh, all around the state. The Panhandle, not so much, not so much in the mm -hmm. rural areas, unfortunately, yeah. but more in populated yeah. areas. So it's all over the state, and they vary in their. Uh, some of them are just now passing their bylaws, but that's one of our priorities at Thales is to mm -hmm. is to develop those affiliates and strengthen them. Yeah, yeah. and how, you know the, the the real sort of balance is strengthening those affiliates while keeping Thales strong at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to you know. We want to we want to do both, and actually, yeah. I think we have a plan for that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. If someone's interested in getting in touch with either Dallas or one of your affiliates, yeah. What's the process? How do they do that? I would just point them to our website. Yeah. You know, T A L A S. Just Google that, and uh, there's a lot of information. How to become a partner? How to become a sponsor? Uh, how to uh, uh, you know our mission, our vision is there. Our leadership is there. Some of our bio our bios are up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the affiliate, some of the affiliate information is on our website. Okay. Everything's on websites now, right? So, yeah, so that's right. the best way, yeah, yeah. easiest way. Okay. And then contact me. I mean, my information is on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned that you have an uh, event coming up in the summer. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it's going to be the last week of June. So okay. Thales, we are a, a branch there. You know, we call ourselves the little sister of TASA. So we sure. really piggyback, as in this event, on all uh, most of the TASA events. Okay. So TASA has a summer conference, and ours will be uh, a day and a half prior to the start of the TASA conference. And that okay. works because it's efficient because a lot of our members right. obviously are TASA there. members. They're already there. Yeah. yeah. So they just book the flight. They stay there, and it, it works for us. So okay. it'll be the last week of June, scheduled for uh, Round Rock and uh, – the Kalahari Resort there. Sure, yeah. yeah. Who, who, who comes to those events? Just the Dallas members or? Yeah, well, yeah. we have, yeah, mostly yeah. Dallas members will come. Yeah. You know, our, our partners, our business partners, uh -huh. will, will uh, sponsors, we call them, will sure. be there as well. Uh, and then we'll just have guests that are not members that we're hoping to recruit. We're recruiting yeah. here for membership, so yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Is there is there anything else, any other information or anything else that you would like to kind of leave our campus leaders with today? I'm just so appreciative, really. You know, as I look back on my career and gone into other, uh, really, professions or worked for other organizations, mm -hmm. one of the things that I uh, am so proud of is the work 
ethic mm -hmm. that is required to be a professional educator. The, um, the why uh, has got to be so clear and so strong because the work is so difficult. Yeah. Um, I see folks that are recognized for working after hours, that have come in for a Saturday, and by the way, they should be. Yeah. Uh, but my whole career, I've been surrounded by people who worked for me and with me, that that was just, we don't want to be recognized, that's just part of what it yeah. has got to be done to make sure we, we do what we have to do. Right. And it's, I'm proud of all of our educators. I'm proud, I call them, I call, I call it the arena. Those that are still in the arena, especially today, especially in the last 48 months, um, what they are doing, it just, it, it really, it just, I get emotional when I think about it because I'm so proud of what they're doing. So uh, I would just thank them and, and encourage them to, what, what there's a saying, if you ever, whenever you feel like you want to quit, remember why you started, and that's kind of what sustained me. Yeah. And I would just hope that that sustains them and because it's all worth it. They are influencing people. Yeah. I mean, I met, I met someone um, just, just today who, who now, you know, it, 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 when, when I was superintendent in San Antonio, and she said, you know, I was a first-year teacher when you were superintendent there. And so she talked to me about going to one of our one of my meetings, and you were behind the podium so far away, but you uh, in, made some sort of something I said influenced her to stay in the profession and keep going. Wow, yeah. So uh, just to remind folks that are out there with both our students, you never know the words of encouragement, how you're going to change somebody's life and keep them in the game. So keep it up. All right. There you have it, folks, with Robert Duron. Um, it was such a pleasure. Robert, thank you so much for coming to speak with me. Um, you can find links to all of the resources that he talked about, some of those books that he mentioned, websites that he mentioned. All of those will be in our show notes. You can find those and links to all those resources there. As always, all of the production is done by Erwin Solbach, um, as well as the music that you can hear right now. Um, our logo and design work was from Alana Kanoi, and all of this is a labor of love from the folks at Responsive Learning. Y'all have a great rest of your day.